Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I am Emily Maxson, filling in for Brian Broom, who's usually filling in for me, um, <laughs> but I'm here with Greg Ettinger, and we're talking of contracts and covenants today. When I was in college, there was a common saying that was, the rejection of Locke is the beginning of wisdom. Would you agree with that? <laughs> you never told me that. Yes, I would absolutely agree with that. But of course, <laughs> the question is, are you rejecting Locke for something better or for something worse? Mm -hmm. But realizing that Locke is not a sufficient answer for anything means you're at least paying attention to the questions. So last time we talked about the conspiracy of light, as we called it, the, um, the time and place or more accurately, the potential of perhaps a time and maybe a place <laughs> for revolution in the Christian life. And one has to ask, what are we rejecting Locke, as you say, and what are we rejecting tyranny in favor of? Where do we go from the revolution? What are we trying to put in, its, in place of what was before? The question is complicated with a lot of rabbit trails along the way. And a lot of things that can be easily misunderstood, a lot of terms that need definition. So we're trying to keep this simple. I'm sure people can find faults with anything I'm about to say, but nonetheless, that this is this this is where we've come this far. When the boy Joe Ash was placed back on the throne, he was brought into covenant with his people and God. First of all, joy to the priest, we are told. Well, let me read, let me actually read the text. Uh, this is um, 2 Kings chapter 11. It says, He, Jehoiada, brought forth the king's son and put the crown upon him and gave him the testimony. And they made him king and anointed him. And they clapped the hands and said, God save the king. Then Athaliah tries to intervene and gets herself killed. And then we go on, and Jehoiada made a covenant between the Lord and the king and the people that they should be the Lord's people, and between the king also and the people, and then they go from there. It's very short. It's very to the point. This is what Jehoiada the high priest and the leaders of Israel thought was the appropriate thing. Israel stood in covenant relationship with God. Athaliah had usurped the throne tried to kill all the royal seed, missed only one. Now they were putting that boy back on the throne in harmony with God's promises to David, God's covenant with David. And there was an official uh, coronation ceremony involved, handing him the law of God, putting a crown on his head, anointing him with oil, all symbolic acts. But there were also two covenant cutting acts, or covenant creation acts. First, a covenant between the king and the people and Yahweh. The people and the king agreed that they work for Yahweh. Their God is their God. And they're going to do what he said. In other words, they're reaffirming the covenant at Sinai. Uh, there was nothing new here, nor was there need for any kind of special revelation or special stipulations. Just, we're going to do what we're supposed to have been doing all the time. Uh, having done that, once that was settled, then Jehoiada made a covenant between the young king and the people. In other words, he swore an oath that he would rule in terms of the Mosaic Covenant, in terms of God's previous revelation, in terms of God's moral law, and uh, the people agreed that they would obey. Now, since this is a covenant, what we're talking about today is largely the distinction between a covenant and a contract, or a covenant and uh, absolute uh, human authority. Well, Covenant means there's no such thing as absolute human authority. <laughs> All authority is delegated. Here, the king is receiving delegated authority from God. He is to use it in such a fashion that recognizes that his authority is limited, derived from God, subject to God's law, and to be used for ministering to and serving the people and upholding God's law order. So if he stops doing that, we've just had evidence that a king can be removed or a queen. So Joash needs to understand that he could possibly forfeit his throne by becoming the kind of tyrant that Athaliah was. Now, as it turns out, Joash in his later years was not such a hot king 
the elders did not remove him from the throne. God called him to account his own way in his own time. But the idea of covenant assumes um, that the king is under law. That whatever authority, whether it be a king, a president, a parliament, the, the leading authority is under law and is, is not absolute. Now, that stood in stark contrast to all the philosophies of the ancient world, all of whom assumed that divinity was incarnate in the king, the, who ruled as a priest king, a son of the gods, and that you did not question the king. You did not, you, you were a slave. Uh, as in Egypt, uh, in Alexander's Greece, and Caesar's Rome. Uh, Christianity and biblical thought brought this new idea that you can have a king, but he can be a constitutional monarch. In fact, in time, it worked out and it doesn't even exactly have to be a king. He can be a chief, a warlord, a prince, a magistrate, a president, a prime minister. The title became less and less important, as did many of the ceremonies connecting it, because the man's not God. The, the office is not a divine office, it's a ministerial office. So that's what Joash had to learn, and that's a good part of the lesson that's going on here. Can so, we stop and sort of make that connection between biblical history and government theory in general? Um, because the, the obvious objection is, well, Israel had a covenant with God already. Right, exactly. They're, they're special. They're special. Yeah, well, they were. And we need to understand that. We need to we need to talk about where the specialness begins and how much of it wasn't that special. The the appeal, well, let me finish, I, I guess, the, the thought of where I was and then tie it to what you're asking, because what you're asking is exactly where we need to go. Uh, we, we can look at Joash and we can say, all right, so based on Israel's covenant with God, this king submits to that arrangement. And uh, the people can hold him accountable. The elders can hold him accountable. He can expect accountability. Now, step outside of Israel. Well, the pagan world wouldn't buy any of that, which is what's kind of the point I was making. But now we stand on the other side of the cross. We've rejected uh, pagan continuity of being philosophy, so we say. We are not eager to claim that a human, explicitly claim that any human being is God, because we're not even sure we believe in God anymore. And, and so sort of by denial, we say, well, there was this interesting thing that Israel had with their God at that time, and then Christ came and somehow the rest of the world forgot its, pagan, its paganism and began offering sort of neutral and secular alternatives. Uh, they weren't what Israel did because Israel was special. Israel was special. And so now back to what I said. So what's the nature of the specialness? Uh, are kings, let, let's use the word king because that's the extreme. You can insert, insert governor, president, prime minister, parliament, Congress, Supreme Court, whatever you like, whoever claims to be making laws that can be enforced. Are these rulers, is this king, is he independent of God? That's the big question that we have to answer, whoever we may be at any time, we right now on the podcast, or um, lawyers, uh, jurists, congressmen, presidents, cabinet members, bureaucrats, where does their accountability to God begin? Do we say, well, those in Israel, because of their special covenant, they had to obey God, but so now we have... Yeah, is it here? Here are some options for you. Um, they don't have to obey God. Period. I don't. I don't think most Christians are going to go with that one. That, that seems just a little bit too wholesale. The most of the world, that is worldlings, those outside of Christ, would probably agree with that one. Yeah, yeah. They don't have to obey your God. That's not. You want to go obey your God? That's fine. But don't try to impose that on the rest of the world. Don't try to bring that into politics, separation of church and state, and all that. All right. Next option for Christians. Well, there is this thing called natural law. 
And we'll be talking about that in a few podcasts. There is some kind of law that exists, and it doesn't matter how it got there, where it came from. Christians will say it came from God. The rest of the world can have a different option. It doesn't matter. They can have a different opinion. But it exists. It's a thing that by reason and experience, by study of mankind and of nature, we can conclude certain things are in some sense either absolutely right and wrong or at least so pragmatically right and wrong you got to be an idiot not to follow them. After that, we're running out of options. You have you can appeal to society, but the problem with that is society keeps changing, and we have seen it change so radically in our in the last 50 years that you no longer have to argue that point. Or if you want to go back to the 1930s and track forward, look at what's happened in the world. Look at what once was considered unthinkable. Uh, for instance, once you could simply use the word Holocaust, and people would, oh, oh, yeah, that's kind of a bad. I mean, that's kind of bad for everybody. Really, nobody should do that. Today, you ask it, and a lot of people will say, the what? And you explain it. Oh, so the, this Nazi Germany thought the Jews were uh, antisocial or a social problem. Yeah. Well, I guess that'd be all right for them then. You can actually say that now because things have changed so quickly. I think the only lesson in there really is that you try to pin your hopes for an absolute morality in society. It doesn't work. I'm not quite sure what else is left. Some kind of pragmatic approach that says we all agree that we want these goals. Oh, wait, we're back to societal norms again. Who's the we? Who's going to decide? Who's the intellectual elite who's going to tell the rest of us what's best for us and why should we listen to them and why do we care? I want what's best for me. And if what's best yeah. for me is not good for you, um, that's your tough luck. <laughs> That's uh, the problem with with creating a utopia is all the other people that have to be in it. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. You can. I mean, you people can come to us and say, for instance, it is in your best interest that 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 people not murder. Yes, it is in my best interest that people not murder. So, all if you can convince everybody else they shouldn't murder, that's great. That benefits me. Now, however, if I can murder because I need to want to feel like it's a convenient thing, and and yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Now, you just created a system that says that that's a problem for me. But as long as I can work around your system, that's fine. I, You have not created an absolute. You've created one of those things that we find so often in life where, yeah, this this is what the the tech manuals say you should do. And we say, that's great. I'm glad that most people do that. I, however, have found a way around it. That works great for me. And as long as I don't tell anybody and nobody files, files a lawsuit, I'm going to do it my way. And there are no absolutes. There are no appeals. Yes, I want you to be nice people. I want to do whatever I please. And you have no appeal beyond that as long as I am sneaky enough to get around you or if I'm the one who calls the shots. Now, I, have, I may have missed something like an appeal to other religions. Um, we could talk about Islam, but we won't, because it's the only real contender right now on the field. <clears throat> Although no one wants to admit that it actually has a different law order that it would love to impose on the world. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're back to, there are only so, lim so many things. So the, 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 the question, by what standard, has to be answered somehow if you're going to talk poli sci at all, if you're going to talk governmental theory. Of course, the option, again, is to not just say, you know what? The world's going to burn. Jesus is coming back any day. He never had a plan for the world. Uh, he certainly doesn't have a plan for us to engage the world or to offer any concrete political solutions of, of any sort in any way at any time under any condition. So let's not even waste our time thinking about it. It's nice if you guys that you want to think about such things, I guess, but it sounds a little legalistic and a little dangerous. So let's just drop that and get back to winning people to Jesus. I think the the impulse to jump to that sounds legalistic because we know that laws can't change people's hearts. Yeah. That's a very easy jump to make. And it's we have to realize that we're not asking a question about salvation. And we have to be okay not answering a question about 
God's eternal election, if that <laughs> yes, makes sense. <laughs> that's true. Now, I, I appreciate the concern when it comes in terms of a badly framed presentation. For instance, if someone says, we need to, America needs to uh, adopt God's basic moral law as its laws. Yes, it does. However, that's not clear. What, your intentions, your plan is not clear. And it sounds an awful lot like a social gospel based upon mm -hmm. what social gospel preachers have said in the past. If you're going to start talking that way, you need to start being very careful about where it's like, well, America needs, no, wait. America needs a lot of things. Yeah. Mostly it needs the Jesus. government of America. <laughs> do you mean the persons yeah, that yeah. live and make up America? What yeah. do you mean? What does the word America mean? And what does the word needs mean? Mm -hmm. uh, is it, do you mean this is something that needs to be imposed from the top down or from the outside? Do we need a nation to come in and conquer us and impose this on us or conspiracy within it to, uh, to rise to power and, and impose it from that direction? Um, or, or are we saying what we are saying of all humanity? You gotta, you gotta serve somebody. There, it's inevitable that we live by a moral standard. The only valid moral standard for men and nations is the Word of God. Now, the problem with that is that we're sinners and we don't like to keep God's law. We don't like to obey His Word. And that is, in, in a general sense, true for Christians. We sing, Oh, how love I thy law. But we must admit at the same time that there is within our nature a law of sin and death at work that keeps warring against the law of the mind so that there's this constant, I cannot do the things I would, see Romans 7. And trying to come to someone or an entire nation and say, here are laws, live by them, and you will be healthy, wealthy, and wise, is not the gospel and is flat out dangerous. It may, in fact, be presenting a social gospel, a very different kind of gospel. So the question, when we let's, let's rephrase the question. Uh, what does America need most? What do the American people, what does every individual American need most right now? To trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord which involves or leads to repentance of sins and a desire to obey. Now, if we got that far, then we can ask the question, how shall we then live? And it's at that point we can start talking about, well, then Americans, in search of moral guidance, in search of the Word of God, need to hear what God actually says. They need to read the Bible and see what it calls them to. And it's at that point then when we can come back and say, well, does, is there anything in the Older New Testaments that does in fact speak to nations, Gentile nations, as nations? Israel had a unique covenant with God. It involved particular feast days, a fast day, uh, Levitical worship, a temple, a uh, divinely appointed kingly line that uh, climaxed in Christ. Uh, those things were special. Those things are not repeatable. Um, it had a particular land. Not everybody gets Palestine, uh, although people keep fussing over it. So there are most certainly things that were unique to God's relationship with Israel, Israel's relationship with God. Our question has to be then is, but are there things that aren't? Uh, the, the first option was, well, let's just completely ignore God's word. Well, let's say that that doesn't work very well. You, you can do that, and people, nations have done that. That's kind of brought us to where we are today at the beginning of the 21st century. Is there another approach that says some of God's word does stand, it is intended for men and nations, uh, and as people come to Christ and want to set their political houses in order, is there, are there some things they should hear and think about? And once you begin to ask the question that way, I think two things become pretty clear. One, yes, the Bible has some very plain things to say to nations within the age of Messiah, within the age of grace. Two, that these things involve this concept of covenant. Uh, we, we live under a new covenant. Does that new covenant affect the nations? Well, Matthew 28 the Great Commission, 
I can quote it, but I'm going to read it anyway, just to make sure I don't drop a word here or there. It says this, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Notice the, the spheres of authority. And the word power there, exousia, means authority, not just bare, bare power. He has the right, we would say, in America. He has the right to give orders to everyone and everything in heaven and earth. Well, that would include all nations. And so he goes and says immediately, go therefore and teach all nations. And the word for teach, as the marginal note will tell you, is discipulos, uh, to make disciples of. The King James margin even takes it further and says, make Christians of. Because disciple and Christian are interchangeable in the New Testament. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. It's the same thing. So Jesus is saying, go disciple, make Christians of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So notice what's in here. We have an absolute sovereignty or power or lordship. We have a representation in terms of this, this authority is being applied. He's telling his apostles and through them his church to go do this thing. He's calling the, that church to disciple the nations, that is to bring them under his conscious conscious authority or conscious submission to him. Not, not simply they will be under his rule as the rocks and trees are under his rule, but there will be a conscious submission to his word, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And they're to receive the covenant seal, and they are to be taught to, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and now I'm with you all, even into the end of the world. And there's continuity. In other words, here is a five-point covenant outline that Jesus set forth as his plan for evangelizing and discipling the nations. Not just bare, bare evangelism, bare, bearing witness, uh, but an actual plan to make nations his disciples. Because he already owns them, because he already has authority over them, they need to recognize that. And their recognition will be to submit to the covenant outwardly by receiving the seal, baptism, and by then doing everything he said that's relevant to them as nations. So here's the, the obvious um, upfront answer of the gospel and of Jesus himself as to what his relationship with the nations is. Uh, he does claim to already own them, to be in control of them, to govern them. He wants from them conscious acknowledgement that this is indeed the case, and a conscious submission to the new covenant by uh, receiving baptism and, and submitting to his word. And he tells us that this is the plan until the end of the age, until he comes again. So here we begin to get a broad answer. Does this answer all of the little questions? No, it doesn't. What, what things from the Old Covenant are still applicable? Well, that's a whole sphere of discussion in itself. But if you go back to the Reformed Confessions, and I'm thinking here the Belgian Confession, the Heidelberg Catechism, the 39 Articles of the Church of England, the Westminster Standards, every one of them says that the king, the princes, the judges ought to rule in terms of God's moral law. The other manifestations or applications they differ on or don't speak to or disagree on. But when it comes to the moral law, there is absolutely no confusion. They, in other words, they agree that men should not steal. They should not kill, as God defines murder and unlawful killing. They should not commit adultery. They should be faithful to their wives they should not commit libel and slander. So again, the Reformed Confessions are very clear about the place of God's moral law, even among um, the lives of nations and governments. Now, as I said, that leaves a lot of questions open, but not nearly so many as you might think. Uh, for instance, when we when we accept that the Bible gets to to find basic morality, it gets to tell us what marriage is mm -hmm. and what it's not. It gets to yeah. tell us when human life begins and that you may not take it. It also tells us when it ends naturally and 
that you may not take it until God calls the man or woman home. It says thou shalt not steal, and it applies it to kings, to governments. So you don't you don't have to dig into the minutia of the judicials of Moses or the claims of our theonomic friends um, to already run into right head to head with this the spirit of this age, who will not have this man Jesus to rule over them. And and thus the desire for alternatives. And sadly, the tendency of Christians to look for alternatives. We mentioned a lock up front, and for people who are lost and have no idea what we're talking about, I should go back and fill that hole. Because in the Enlightenment, uh, which is a period of time from just before 1700 on into almost 1800, and with influences going to the modern day, uh, this age of reason, this Enlightenment, tried to look for neutral ground that all logical, intelligent men could agree upon, stand upon, and from which foundation they could reconstruct society. In some cases, the motives seemed admirable enough. We, we've we tried appealing to the Bible, and that led to the wars of religion. Uh, we can't, you can all say the Bible's clear, but it's not because people keep fighting, and they fight over things like the proper definition of the Lord's Supper. You live on the street and next door on one side is a Lutheran, on the other side is Presbyterian, across the street is Roman Catholic, over there is a Quaker. And you know what? We get along fine. We don't need to kill each other. We don't even need to argue. Sometimes we have heated discussions over the fence, and that's as far as it ever goes. So why these wars of religion? Why Isn't there some bigger neutral thing that we can stand upon? Newton had just written Principia, which seemed to frame the universe in terms of mathematical law. Descartes, a bit before him, had started with the words, I think, therefore I am, and tried to develop an entire philosophy of epistemology of knowledge and existence based upon the self-evident truth of his own existence. And then we come to others like John Locke who say, well, taking a little bit of all that, it is obvious empirically that God of some sort exists, and that the Bible is, well, at least he probably exists, high percentage of probability, and the Bible's probably his word, and Jesus is probably his son. But ignoring that, the morality that we we live with is a rational morality that exists within the universe of a rational God who can be rationally proved. And so we don't need the Bible to construct political society. What we need to do is to reckon logically, rationally, how such a thing might have happened, uh, and on the assumption that it, in fact, did happen that way, or at least close enough to not matter, let's let's just assume that that men, by nature, as individuals, are free, independent, with the rights of life, liberty, and property. Let us further assume that sooner or later they run into each other, and it's kind of hard to work that one out, because I reach for the, the <laughs> apple that you reach for, who gets it? Um, so do we decide on the spot? Am I, do I present more logical uh, arguments for the apple than you do? Uh, do we have a slugfest, win or take all? Or is there some other logical, rational way of structuring society? And what he came up with, and others would do the same, was a contract or compact. People get together, the people who think they're going to run into each other a lot get together, and they give their word that they're going to exist as a contractually united people um, for the purposes of protecting life, liberty, and property. And that having created the society, the society will then generate covenant protectors, magistrates, a civil government, a covenant, not covenant, sorry, contractual civil government that exists <laughs> on top of this contractual society. And we will pick those things that seem to best fit our life, liberty, and property, being basically rational people. Because remember, I keep saying rational, logical, because that's what the Enlightenment was all about. Mm -hmm. Reason is neutral. Reason is not fallen. You may be lazy in your reason, but that's your problem. Uh, someone who's smarter and more active with his reason can point out the faults and get you back on track if you're willing to be taught. Together, we can reason our way to a a society that will protect all of our rights, all of our liberties, all of our properties, 
And once we have the society, then we establish the, the guardians of our society. And if at any point those guardians stop doing their job, we can take it away from them, we the people, and we can replace it with something else, other guardians who will do a better job. We're not going to do that every time someone screws up because that's unreasonable. <laughs> And in case you haven't caught it, I'm quoting from the or paraphrasing the Declaration of Independence. Yeah, this is very much the Tom Jefferson that we talked about last yeah. time. Yeah, exactly. Now, the thing here is we got here presumably by ignoring the Bible, ignoring Christianity. We did posit a God of some sort. And since Locke personally was an evangelical Christian and a Trinitarian, that seems to he then he must have been talking about the Trinitarian God, so that's okay. Well, it is funny because last time we talked about why we think it's kind of reasonable to, well, there I go using the word reasonable, but we sort of came up with arguments for potential right to revolution last time. Yeah. And now we have other people getting to the same conclusion, taking a totally different path Yeah. that we totally vehemently <laughs> disagree with. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and the thing is that the, those two things met in America in the let's, late 1770s is divine providence. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that's not going to happen again in the history of the world, although I am no prophet. But there was a unique series of circumstances. John Locke was the, was the child of Puritans. He'd heard all the Puritan theology. He'd heard covenant theology. He just didn't like it. But he did not reject Christianity wholly, so he was okay with having a God loosely defined, though that is loosely defined for the world, for himself personally, presumably. He trusted in Christ and was Trinitarian, so I'm, so I'm told. But as far as his public argument was concerned, concerned and that's what we have to hold him to, mm -hmm. he was content with a vague God who created the world in some fashion and made man in his image and established for him a natural law, which he says bluntly, that law is reason. And because of the way he thought, the way he had been raised, and the society he was in, he modeled, paralleled, black mirrored side by side what the Puritans had said. That is, sovereign God, more or less sovereign God, ordains man in his image and gives him a law, creates man with the capable, uh, capability of reason and gives him natural law. That is what his reason will discover. Uh, God calls us into covenant with one another in family, church, and state. God calls us to make contracts, or at least allows this, allows the possibility of contracts when we feel we need them. God's covenants are for establishing and defending his law order. Our human contracts are defending life, liberty, and property, which is some of the commandments, rightly understood, perhaps. <laughs> Does marriage go in there? Is that pursuit of happiness? I'm not sure. Um, and the because covenantally, because the powers that be are to enforce this law, when they get out of line, they may, as covenant provisions make possible, be disciplined, chastised, removed, or lock. They break the contract, the people may replace them with other guardians without destroying society because society comes first. And covenantally speaking, but the society continues because it the people themselves are covenanted with God, and God doesn't give them the permission to go walk every, every man in his own way. There is a continuity factor that rests in God and his claims, not upon the will of the people. John Locke falls back on tacit consent. Well, you're all still here. None of you have left, so I guess you signed on whether you like it or not. And so there is a parallelism here. And people who were not listening carefully in the 1770s could be professing Trinitarian Christians and also read Locke and not really see a difference. Or they could be Lockean and say, well, here's a wonderful quote from uh, the pastor's election sermon. Let's borrow from that, because he said it so well, although I don't believe with the context, but this particular quote I can borrow. And so we come down to the War for Independence and we have people, we have Presbyterian pastors preaching the thing as a revival. Uh, we're, we're, we're doing this to defend the kingdom of God against uh, the Church of England and Babylon the Great and all that. Or we have the other side, people like Adams and Madison, 
uh, arguing that this is a this is a war for freedom rationally understood based upon a god who is unitarianish but who provides some kind of moral order through natural law and as long as we don't talk too deeply or long it looks like we're pursuing the same ends and we're even using the same language but as soon as the war was over it became very clear that something was wrong, something was off. And trying to trace America's Christian history from that point on becomes more a tracing of the life of the evangelical church in America uh, than of tracing the nation's covenantal acts abroad or within itself. And so you start looking at it. Do you, do you look at the the farmer out tilling his field and the and the family going to church, or do you look at black slavery and breaking treaties with the Native Americans? And you know, where's the Christianity in America if America, if the American government and the state governments, the county governments, are not accountable to the Word of God? Do we say, but but there's this wonderful heritage because they keep sp speaking about God and the Bible? Yeah, they do. God and the Bible, Jesus, the Gospel. The public schools were established to make the new immigrants Christians and forbidden to talk about Jesus. And that was early in our history. So and here, here we come down to, I think, the, the place where we needed to, to distinguish covenant and contract. Covenant is a commitment of life under God. Contract is commitment of time and energies and wealth to a particular circumstance for a limited period of time. Covenant if I break it, I fall under the judgment of God himself now and possibly in eternity if I don't repent. Contract, I break it. Well, can they catch me before I skip town? <laughs> uh, but worst, I'm going to stand before court and pay a bill. Probably not a whole lot's going to happen because I'm not committing my life. I'm committing uh, some energy, some time, some labor, some money. And that's it. Whatever the worst that can happen is not me dying. With a covenant, death is a real thing. We to marriage till death do us part. Um, breaking our federal oath is generally called treason and used to carry the death penalty. Uh, when we defile the Lord's Supper, God may call us home. He may and He may kill us. Uh, there is a vast difference between these two. Superficially, first glance, you can say, well, they, they look very similar. Why can't we just go with the one? And, and, and this is something that I was, was kind of thrown at me once. Uh, well, people don't can't accept the Bible, but they can't accept John Locke. You know what? <laughs> only a few very naive Christians accept John Locke anymore. Of course, only not all Christians accept the Bible either. So you got that to work with. <laughs> But since Darwin, we no longer believe in a rational creation. Man's a beast at best. And since Freud and beyond, it's uh, B.F. Skinner, man is a collection of chemicals. What is this natural law thing? What is this love your neighbor thing? Uh, can't I do whatever I want? And why can't I? And how can you stop me? And aren't you just as evil for stopping me as you say I am for wanting to do the evil thing? In the what is this evil anyhow? And there's no longer, we're at the point where you have to choose a side. We have to be able to say, because Jesus says so. And they can laugh on our faces, but there are no other answers. We've tried them, they've run out. We go to the young man, the young woman considering abortion. And we say, but the baby's a person. They say so. But the baby's alive. Yeah, so. But you're, you're going to be killing a human being. Yeah, and? 20 years ago, we refused to say, because God says so, because Jesus says so, here's the text. Because not everyone would believe that or accept that. We, so we, we fell back on evidences and images, bloody pictures. And I warned people at the time, this is not going to work very long. And now we're there. And yeah, of course the child is a person. That's not the issue. This person is invading another person and who is older and more sophisticated and more valuable to society. This 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 little person has no right to do that. So there you go. Or yeah, it's it's person biologically, but uh, society has not given its stamp of approval. So society's laws can't protect it. 
And where are we going to stand short of the Bible tells me so? And when we're afraid to do that, we have a problem. When we think there's some other thing we can appeal to, some other pragmatic argument, sociological argument, a moralistic argument, traditional argument, we're, we're, we're losing them. Nobody believes anymore. Everybody simply wants to do their own thing, sort of like the Book of Judges. And judgment is ripe to fall. The one thing that may stay back is if the church gets on its knees and then gets on its feet and starts yelling, here's the gospel. This is why Jesus died. This is what Jesus demands. We know you don't like it. We know, in fact, you hate it. Repent and believe. So that's so. back to the original argument. Are we trying to, to push a social gospel? No, because <laughs> it won't work. <laughs> and it's wrong. And it's contrary to the gospel of Christ. And that's the reversed order, by the way. That it doesn't work is, is, is tertiary or, or more down the list. Primarily, it's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, go preach the gospel, disciple the nations, bring them to himself. And then they're going to have some questions. When the Iron Curtain fell, there were, there were the powers that be in Russia actually said to the church, the Western church, come over and help us. Where are your PhDs who, have, who are experts in economics and social theory, in political theory? in medicine, in literature, come and help us and teach us. The window was very short. And the church said, what? <laughs> and that ended that. We missed a key moment because we were not willing to think of what happens after they come to Christ. Won't they have questions? And if they do, will we have the answers? Mm. Sobering thoughts. It is time to move on to recommendations. It is. I think I will jump in first with a recommendation that doubles as a thank you to our lovely transcriptionist. Oh, good. Um, who uh, donates the time to transcribe all our podcasts. I especially appreciated that this week as I was able to go back and read the transcript from <laughs> your conversation about princesses, which I missed. Um and I what, you didn't listen to the whole dialogue? Um, for some reason, I had access to the transcript without, I don't know. I don't <laughs> remember right. what Never series mind. of circumstances. But anyway, I'm a faster reader than I am a listener, right? Mm, a lot so, of people are. Yeah. It's, so it was very um, convenient to be able to read the transcript and kind of get the rundown. And so I will double recommend reading our transcripts. Mm -hmm. And also that conversation about princesses. I, I think it's so refreshing to think about the, the romance of the gospel, where I think in, in the Calvinistic circles, it's kind of easy to forget that the princess is longing for her prince to come. Mm. Like we skip to the fact that she's dead because of the magical apple or she's asleep <laughs> in, because she pricked herself on the spinning wheel, where there's that character establishing moment before that, yeah. <laughs> where her heart is toward the prince and she longs for him. And I think that's important and easily overlooked. Oh. Jesus is the desire of nations. Mm -hmm. And while, yes, we understand total depravity, we're not saying that. We are saying that nobody wants to go to hell forever. We would like to be saved. No one likes the corruption of sin, really. There are very, very, very few. And yet we want to do our own thing. If only there were somebody <laughs> who could give us a whole new world and a whole new me. Oh, well, a never whole new mind. Life. Yeah, like <laughs> no. there's always the I want song, right? Like Ariel yeah. wants to be part of a different world. Rapunzel yeah. is waiting for her life to begin. It's, it, there's a lot of depth in that. You know, the, the God-sized hole that none but Jesus can fill. It's a real thing. And although we will, until the Holy Spirit cracks us open and, and pours himself in, we'll never get it exactly. But there is that sense. Isaiah says the, the nations will, the isles will wait for his law. What does that mean if it doesn't mean mm -hmm. that there's an understanding that something's wrong, something's mm -hmm. broken? read the popular music of this day or any day. Once you get past the, yeah, yeah, life is good, you're going to get down to the life is horrible. And there's got to be a better way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the bright weights. Um, I'm going to recommend uh, something less positive. 
<laughs> but easier to assimilate. And I, th I think it would make a good um, framing device for this. There's a little book um, called The Children's Story. I may have recommended it before, but mm. I'm going to recommend it again. It's by James Clavell. It will take you all of 15 or 20 minutes to read. Uh, it may even be available on the net for free. Um, yeah, I don't know if it's supposed to be, but it definitely is because I've recommended <laughs> it to people and sent them copies. Yes, so, yes. so you, you can look there. I was uh, blessed by the Lord to to find a hardback, still in the plastic kind of wrapper uh, version. But the story uh, begins with the war is over and they have won. And it tracks the action in a small, I think it's like first grade classroom, as the new teacher comes in. And basically begins to brainwash the children. But mm -hmm. as you watch what she does, we as adults can understand her moves. There's nothing violent. There's nothing directly abusive. In fact, as the children, she asked the children simply for definitions. What do you mean pledge? What do you mean allegiance? Why do you pray? Does anyone hear you? Does, in your experience, oh, in your experience, they didn't, God doesn't answer you. Well, what if I can give you what you want? And step by step, she dismantles the children's worldview in about 20 minutes. And it's fascinating and it's horrible. And it's it's important to to point to something we talked about earlier. You got to have definitions. Mm -hmm. Liberty, freedom, justice. What in the world do those words mean? And if you can define them without bringing God into the equation, then your definition is worthless. Mm -hmm. uh, you you need to have the foundation of the word of God, all else is sinking sand. And although Clavel was not himself a Christian, as far as I know, this is a good book to make you step, stop and think, I've been teaching my kids all these words. Do they actually know what they mean? Can they explain the gospel at all? Mm -hmm. Really? Uh, you might find it sobering to ask your children the question and see what you get. So mm -hmm. James Clavel, The Children's Story. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been a Enjoy. pleasure. Uh, thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thanks, as I said before, to our transcriptionist. We appreciate you. Uh, thank you also to you, our listeners. We love that you tune in. Uh, hope you'll join us again. Um, if you'd like to join the number of our financial supporters, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting toward Zion. Big thank you to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. Um, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can send us an email at haltingtowardzion at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening. See you soon.